Force Solutions is the title of today's event. Uh, but before we start uh, with the event, first of all, uh, I'm Peter Hood, uh, Chairman of the CBDC Board. I'd like again to welcome you all here at beautiful uh, Norwich University on this, I think, beautiful, uh, beautiful spring day. Vermont has uh, never looked more beautiful than it did this morning driving down, uh, driving down from Montpelier. Um, we are, uh, you can see the uh, camera over here, we're streaming live on uh, Orca video today. That's a new, uh, a new thing for us. And within a few days, uh, if any of you are interested in going back and reviewing anything you hear this morning, uh, this presentation and this whole program will be on the Orca, Orca video website. So our speakers can review their presentations and critique themselves. <laughs> or, uh, hopefully you'll be so interested in what they have to say that you'll, uh, you'll want to hear it again. I hope so. Um, a couple of thank yous. Uh, first of all, uh, Sam and Jen, without whom obviously this program uh, would never happen. Thank you guys for all your hard work putting this together. And we have Joan helping us out this morning and Casey, our summer intern. So uh, if you get a chance, please introduce yourselves uh, to them. So without our sponsors, uh, this program would not be uh, possible. And first of all, a big thank you to uh, Norwich University for this beautiful uh, space. Um, our gold sponsor, uh, National Life of Vermont, we're gonna hear a little bit from them in a minute. Um, and the other sponsors are on your, uh, on the green, uh, whatever you call them, things that are on the tables, but I'm, I'm going to read them up just quickly. Carol Ellison, Creative Workforce Solutions, Hickok and Boardman Insurance Group, I've already mentioned Norwich, Noel W. Johnson Insurance, Northfield Savings Bank, Nikon Coatings, Onion River Sports, Orca Media, Rock of Ages, and Redstone Properties. Uh, Thank you all, one and all sponsors, for your support of our program. Um, Tim Shea is here from National Life. Tim, just to say, uh, just to say a few words. Thank you. So, I'm Tim Shea with National Life Group. I work in uh, facilities uh, as well as in purchasing. And just here to represent National Life Group, I want to uh, again extend uh, thanks to Sam and Jen for putting this on. And uh, National Life certainly is happy to be uh, the sponsor of this event, as well as having, uh, for quite some time, representation on the board uh, with uh, Central Mountain Economic Development. And uh, outside of that, certainly happy to, uh, to be able to uh, take the time to uh, represent National Life, help support the local economy. We try to do uh, what we can through our foundation and through the support of the local businesses, with whether that's the uh, procurement of the goods and services or uh, the uh, many hundreds of thousands of dollars that we try to uh, influx within the, the community, uh, Vermont primarily, uh, with uh, the work of the foundation. So thanks to you all and uh, thank you very much Tim. And again, uh, thank you from uh, the National Life. Um, we're very happy to have Greg uh, Woodworth on our, uh, on our board. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Matt Dunn. Matt has focused his life's work on bringing together the worlds of entrepreneurship, service, and politics. Elected to the Vermont House at the age of 22, he served seven years before joining the Clinton administration as director of AmeriCorps uh, Vista, overseeing 6,000 full-time people working in the fight against poverty. In 2002, he returned home to Vermont and was elected to two terms in the Vermont Senate. Outside of the legislature, he worked in the high-tech marketing and before joining Google, was the associate director of the Rockefeller Center at Dartmouth College. At Google, Matt supports the company's local corporate social responsibility activities in 30 communities where Google has an office or data center, as well as helping guard larger corporate partnerships with the nonprofit and public sector. Matt lives on a small farm where we grew up in Heartland, Vermont, good job, uh, with his wife and three children. But without further ado, Matt. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, thank you, uh, and I'm delighted to be here. This is a very long hall, and I have uh, slides that may have small writing, so I'm going to try to explain what's going on here as we go, uh, but please let me know if you can't hear or things don't make sense. Um, I'm going to, you know, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, how to infuse creativity into economic development, and what I'm going to do is try to blend what I talk about frequently on a, on a national front about Google and innovation and technology and the internet and economic development in Vermont from my time doing things in the legislature and working with many of you here trying to figure out how to create jobs for the next century in the Green Mountain State. Um, I'm not sure if that combination will work, but we're going to give it a try, uh, and then um, hopefully Matt Boosie, my friend, will save me with a better presentation afterwards. So, um, I <laughs> don't... <laughs> Uh, that's it, right there, look at that. There we are. The presentation thing here, where is it? It's right there. How do you just present? Got it. There is a guarantee that if you are <coughs> There's a guarantee if you are the uh, Google guy making the presentation, your tech will not work. So I will uh, give you that uh, warning up front. So I want to start off with uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, one of the experiences I had in Vermont in, in business and in working on economic development, just to kick this off. And it was, it was two things that happened. Um, one was I, I worked in the 90s for a company called Logic Associates. We were a vertical market ERP company based in Wilder. We grew to 120 employees, and we, we sold the company. And we sold the company for twice our revenue. And we were literally in, on the shipping deck uh, uh, sh uh, clinking uh, beers, uh, celebrating the sale. And I got a crisis phone call from the government saying, oh my God, what happened? What can we do to stop this? And it was an interesting disconnect uh, because it was, we were there celebrating what we felt was the success and the perception of the time uh, in economic development was that that was a, an emergency, a disaster, and somehow something had gone terribly wrong. The second thing that happened was that Hinda Miller and I, a, a, a entrepreneur herself, and uh, she and I arrived in the state senate together, went around trying to figure out how could we look at economic development differently from the perspective of state policy and the legislature and our, our position as senators. So we went around the state, we were talking to all kinds of experts, some of you here in this room, about what could the future of economic development look like in the state of Vermont. And we got a presentation from you know one of the that there's really three economists that people listen to in the state of Vermont, and I'm not going to name which one this is, but they gave a presentation on the state of the economy in Vermont, and they had one of their presentations was a map of Vermont, and what they did is they had a gradation from blue, uh, sorry, from red, where there were lots of jobs, to black, where there were very, very few jobs in the state of Vermont, very few, few Vermont jobs. And what it showed was the Upper Valley, the area that I was from and representing, as black. And I, and I looked at it and I said, you know, maybe you have your data wrong. I'm, I'm kind of curious what that is because, in fact, in the Upper Valley, and specifically in the Hartford area, we have the lowest unemployment in the state. Why is that black? And they said, oh, you know, the Upper Valley is kind of a problem because, yes, they have a lot of jobs, but those aren't Vermont jobs. And I said, really? Um, so why is that? And they said, because those are jobs that are in other states. And I said, so the job that I have as the associate director of, uh, of the Rockefeller Center at Dartmouth College, is that a Vermont job? They said, no, 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 that's a New Hampshire job. And I said, well, my friend who's an associate editor for the New York Times Upfront magazine and does it out of Wire Junction, rents a space there, and is in New York one week a year, is that a Vermont job? They said, no, 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 that's a New York job. So this was an interesting thing to sort of, to, to think about, which is the idea of what is a Vermont job and what is not a Vermont job. I would say I was very happy with the job that I had, and my friend Patricia was happy with the job that she had. And it, it, it started us thinking about how 
we have to look at the economy a little bit differently as we're uh, moving forward. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, technology, if I can get the link to work. Uh, <laughs> And that's not it. <laughs> I'm going to pop out of. OK. So one of the things that I, I think is important to uh, recognizes how fast the internet is growing and what's happening on it. Uh, and what this uh, very clever um, infographic, which I found yesterday, which usually can pop up. Gives you a real time. This is this is something that was uh, just posted a, a couple weeks ago. A real time look at the amount of information that is hap that is moving on the internet right now. Uh, very shortly, if we haven't hit it already, there will be three billion people online, and that's up from 500 million about you know six or seven years ago. So there's a huge increase in the number of people who are online, and there's also this huge amount of information that is being able to be utilized over a period. And what this is is a live counter, uh, given the current metrics of people who are tweeting, uh, people who are uploading video or watching video on YouTube, the number of searches that are taking place, and, you know, and all these other things, Yelp and Foursquare and other kinds of things. Um, the, I mean, the statistic that I find fascinating is that there is now 100 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but since we don't erase any of it, you can just imagine what that looks like in terms of a jump. But what it also means is all of this is happening without regard to geography. All of this kind of information exchange, because it is in many cases, you know, in two directions, and there's over uh, you know, two million emails that, that move every second in each direction, uh, as well as all of these other kinds of interactions that are taking place from wherever in the world to wherever in the world in, in uh, real time. So the question is, how does that happen? And let me see if I can get the PowerPoint back and pull it up. And the answer is cloud computing. <laughs> Uh, this is something that's come about really in the last 10 years, although it's really taken off recently, where the ability to actually do technology and to be able to have computing power is no longer isolated in places where there are physical computers on site, which used to be the case. It is actually because of things called data centers. Um, this is one of Google's data centers. It's in Hamina, Finland. Uh, it used to be a paper mill for newsprint. Um, the fact that we bought a bankrupt paper mill for newsprint and turned it into a Google data center was not lost on the media of Europe at the time. Uh, <coughs> um, but it does, it, what happens is that all of the computing power is able to be in a distributed place, whether it's here or in Iowa or anywhere else. And so no longer are people limited by what they have at their business, at their facility, at their desktop, at their university. The amount of computing power that you have is, is essentially unlimited. Not only in storage, the ability to upgrade, but also the ability, you know, what I refer to as technically as kerchunking power, but the ability to actually do routines or the kind of computing that was, used to be limited to very, very uh, 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 asset-rich uh, organizations or companies. Who knows what this is? Anyone know what this is? And Lars, you're not allowed to talk. Um, so this is, this is what's called Raspberry Pi. 
Uh, and what the cloud computing has done is it's also not only allowed for the computing to take place elsewhere, but it's allowed devices to shrink in terms of their size and their cost. This is a computer. It retails for about $40. It has a USB port, it has an ethernet port, and it has a connection to your screen or to your laptop. And for that amount of money, you're able to access the largest computing power ever available to anyone in the history of mankind, but for that amount of money. So as that is beginning to decline, the ability to access information is also changing dramatically. And this is, I, 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 uh, I use this picture, well there's a number of ironies in this, but I, I won't go into them. Um, but, but what this means is that an individual who is in the, a child in Africa with access to a not very sophisticated smartphone now has access to all of the information that was available to the entire Reagan administration. And that's a fundamental shift because if, if information is power and the ability to utilize information in order to do innovation and change and technological advancement and entrepreneurship, it is now being distributed to anywhere in the world. And while I have a picture here of a, you know, a child in Africa, it could also just as easily be a child in the Northeast Kingdom, right? Because at one point in time, the constraints that we had as Vermonters was our rural nature, was the limitation of the library that we had in our school, or the ability to access information in the big city of Burlington or New York, and that competitive disadvantage was a real thing, and it no longer exists. What also has happened is that communication has changed. Who here remembers when you used to stress about long distance calls? <laughs> remember that when you used to think about, yeah, when, and, and I would be told to get off the phone, Matt, it's a long distance call, right? That's a very concerning thing. Phone call, uh, Calling someone on the phone is now free. And not only is calling someone on the phone free, video conferencing is free. Right? As long as you have a Gmail account, you have a connection to the internet, you can have a video conference in real time with people all over the world. This is the Jane Goodall Institute. Her board members are literally all over the globe. They have their board meetings online. It costs them nothing except for just having the original camera that's in their laptop and, and other things. We did a project just recently in, in Vermont where we donated video conference equipment, higher and video, to libraries across the state because they were able to use Skype or Hangout or other tools to be able to have video conferencing throughout the library system but also throughout the world. And so those entities can then become portals to conversations and communications across the board. And what it allows for is some interesting entrepreneurship to happen. Uh, and I, this is, a, a, I believe, a good central Vermont company. Um, some of you may recognize uh, my friend here, Steve Hinchton, uh, also a recovering legislator in Vermont. Uh, and Steve uh, started rebuilding uh, an Airstream, because he, and he loved rebuilding this Airstream. And some of us can get into that, right? And he needed a couple of parts, and they didn't exist. And so he found a machinist, I think in Springfield, from the machine tool capacity that was there. And he said, oh sure, I'll make you those parts. And while I've got the lathe on, I'll make you an extra 50. Because it really doesn't cost that much more. So he got an extra 50 parts. And he was like, huh, I wonder if there is some market for those extra 50 parts. He posted it online and he sold it in, tw in 48 hours. He just, boom, off they went. And he said to himself, huh, there might be something here. So he started an entire company which is now very successful online in that niche market, which he can do of people who are passionate about Airstream parts. He's able to advertise online <laughs> using you know, keywords which are Airstream parts, which not a lot of people bid on, but he's able to target his audience very well and be at the long tail and be quite successful from right here in Vermont. So that kind of entrepreneurship can happen, but it also can ha allow for people to work remotely for large corporate companies. Um, this is, for those of you who don't recognize it, this is the uh, Google Vermont headquarters office uh, in the top, top building in downtown Wherever Junction. We are a roaring number of three that work out of there, although they all travel as much as I do, so we rarely run into each other. Um, but 
the, the ability for me to be able to run a 12-person team covering multiple continents uh, for a company like Google from Vermont is because of this technology and innovation as long as we are thinking about it that way. And I, I recently spoke at, a, a, uh, for, at an organization gathering over in Middlebury that is actually doing uh, a young professionals group focused specifically on telecommuters. And so in this room were people who were working for Intel and Sports Illustrated and GM and other companies all over the country. They had some connection to Vermont somewhere and they were all trying to find common space and camaraderie while they were trying to do this distance learning. So in order to get to the potential of this creative economy, we, we need to recognize a few things that we know. Um, and none of this is, is you know, particularly groundbreaking, but it's a shift from where we were doing economic development even 10, 15 years ago. The first is that companies go to people now. If you look at where Google sets up their major operations, I don't quite count fire reduction, although they did show up there because uh, they needed my skill set and the skill set of the other people work out of there. We said we're not moving, and I guess they needed enough that they were willing to allow an office there. But otherwise, we're right, you know, literally in the heart of Carnegie Mellon, or in the heart of MIT, or where we were founded right outside of Stanford uh, University. So companies go to people rather than the other, you build something and everyone sort of shows up, uh, is forced to go there. Um, Vermont will struggle to compete in commodities. If you've been outside of Vermont, you just gotta know, if, they're, if it's commoditized, it is not going to be able to be successful in Vermont because of the other values and priorities that we have. It's just too difficult in the global marketplace uh, and, and, uh, and much less in other parts of the country. Um, it is unlikely that we will attract another large corporate campus to plump down in the state of Vermont. Those days, I mean, it's just, I mean, we've got the new commissioner of economic development here. That is going to be a very, very hard thing to do. And I don't think it's necessary or necessarily healthy for the state. Uh, source of food across the country, much less across the world, is a growing concern, which I think is to our advantage. I'm not going to get too much into that, but it's something to think about because it's looking for value add and trusted brands. But the final piece I want to leave you with is, is that Vermont success is about exporting IP or intellectual property and importing cash. That's where we're able to do well where we export ideas and, and creations and products that are innovative, and they send us money to do them. Norwich University is a perfect example of that, probably one of the more obvious ones, where we are, at, where Norwich is exporting knowledge to the students that are here, but also through their robust online program, and money is coming into the state in that way. But that's true for software companies, and that's true for other entities around, and that's how we get stronger, uh, a stronger economy. And we have big opportunities. We've got a great brand, we've got a strong quality of life, strong public schools, a unique geographic position that I'll talk about. We have underutilized infrastructure and right-of-ways that we've just held on to for a long time. Uh, you know, it, and, and both this and the quality of life, it's sort of what Frank Bryant used to say. It was like we were on a race with other states on a round track. We got so far behind, we ended up ahead. <laughs> right? And, and, and it's, it's sort of true, right? We didn't screw up these things. We didn't sell our rail, uh, our rail access points uh, or let them go bankrupt and go away. And now they're available for both transportation but also for fiber optic uh, connectivity. We have the size and scale to potentially move quickly. And we've got authentic communities that people are really looking for and is more and more a part of economic development standings. Uh, but we, I mean, the biggest thing that we have is brand. Uh, and I, and, and it, but it goes both ways. Um, first of all, I would challenge anyone to tell the difference between Vermont maple syrup and New Hampshire maple syrup. That's a tough taste test to do. I will always buy Vermont maple syrup, but you know what? We get a premium for it. And my wife's family, uh, the Taylors, have you know farm in Plainfield, New Hampshire, and they get apoplectic about how you can get just like two miles over the river, uh, another 20% for your maple syrup, then they are able to get it. But it also goes the other way, because the general perception uh, of Vermont is that it's about old school agricultural things. It is not seen as a place 
that can have a MyWeb brochure, a dealer.com, uh, entities that can actually move the needle in technology and advancement. But the biggest thing that I, I think it's important for us to recognize is our location. We are actually at the epicenter of three major metropolitan areas of New York and Boston and Montreal. And in fact, that's not all that different in size than the tech triangle in North Carolina. <coughs> it just happens that North Carolina is a bigger state, and therefore, you know, it, it, it all fits within one state dynamic. And if we think of ourselves at the epicenter and at the place where you actually want to live in this triangle, we can think about ourselves as that location where people can go to noodle, to experiment, and to be able to deliver new innovative uh, approaches. Um, some of you have heard me talk about broadband in the past, and I will continue to talk about broadband. Um, we are still, in the latest report that I pulled up last night, we're still last in the country in terms of actual broadband speeds that are available. We're making progress, and the governor is putting his back behind making progress, but we are still last. And the painful part to me is my, my uh, current work for my team is mostly about bringing gigabit speed fiber to places other than Vermont. And we're going to met metro areas where we can move fast and all kinds of other things, and we are not coming to Vermont, so please don't hit me up afterwards over and over again, at least not in the next couple of years. But we need to be really, really focused on this because this is a constraint which we can't have if we're going to succeed. Um, we need to expand our transportation. I am completely addicted to Lebanon Airport. It may seem like a little blip, but it is how I'm able to get to uh, the Google office in New York or the Google office in Washington, D.C. faster than my colleagues coming from the suburbs. And that gives me a competitive advantage which allows me to do what I do and lots of other people will crowd in with me on the nine-seat plane. Uh, and, but it's important to have that rail and air transportation for business work. We have millions of square feet of authentic, empty factory space and we have to invest in higher education. I believe we're, we're 49th or 50th right now. Take your pick. That's not going to be a sustainable place if we want to be able to be a center of innovation. The question then becomes, what does a creative economy look like? And I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. I believe we need to have a larger population. One of the most concerning things for me to see in our ranking right now for business development in the country is actually our cost of doing business isn't so bad. We're right in the middle the country, of all the states. And that many other factors are in our favor. But the, the, the lowest ranking, the, the, the ranking that we've been falling in is in the quality of our workforce. And that's a very, very precarious place. That was always Vermont's advantage, was that we had an extraordinarily well-trained, ready-to-go workforce. Um, but because of some of the demographic shifts that are happening, uh, as well as people leaving the states after they've gotten superb educations here and at VTC and at other institutions. That workforce is declining, and if we're going to do it, if we're going to actually be able to grow, we have to have, I believe, a larger population that's on the younger side. Uh, we don't have to create sprawl development in order to do that. We have plenty of capacity in our downtowns and locations, but we have to do that. We need to have a 4x increase in the number of startups, the number of new business starts in general in Vermont has been on the decline since 2003, and that's a precarious place to be. Uh, and we, we need to be able to create opportunities for clusters around in, uh, emerging innovation. And I, I've actually moved away. I used to be this believer that we had to pick things that we were good at and then cluster around it. But all the research actually shows that it's way too much trying to predict the future. You need to create the environment where you can have innovation happening across all different kinds of sectors, rather than trying to pretend we can pick one and go deep on it somehow. Because by the time you get there going deep, it's then six other things that have been able to emerge over time. And innovators, just like other innovators, they don't need someone who's also doing mapping or someone who's also necessarily doing food. They want people who are thinking outside the box. And the other one is, is by towns and having interesting places for people to work. Um, this is a Google office, which is a usual open space. There are not big cubicles or walls or offices with doors. It's creating that type of space, whether it's a co-work space, like we have in emerging in different parts of the state, um, or it's the kind of space that people would want to set up their uh, innovative operations.
This is a complicated slide, but I just want to talk about it because this is what that kind of economy would look like. And I sometimes talk about it as a churn economy, and it gets, back when I was doing politics, it got me into trouble because people don't like the idea of churn. They like the idea of stability, where people are going to be able to show up when they're 22, start a job, and then be able to retire with them at the end. But the economy that's available in Vermont, for the most part, I believe is going to be in this area where there are startups, that move through a process of hopefully being able to have investment and growth, they get to a certain size, and then they sell. And then the question is, what happens to that intellectual asset and the resources that come out of that sale? If we can be proactive and make sure that those go back into the incubator system where they can start 10 additional companies, of which you know three will make it through this process, then you can create an ecosystem that will be able to grow over time and will be able to have hiring opportunities for people who are in here taking a risk. Because if there aren't other options when they're taking a risk, they're not going to take that risk. And if they need to move up to the area to be able to make uh, a difference, or to be able to, to participate in an entrepreneurship uh, activity, frequently they are married and their spouse needs to do something. Right? which is a huge barrier when you're trying to recruit people is, all right, I don't know what my wife will do or my husband will do. Uh, and, and the, or, or will I be able to meet a spouse? Right? That's, we used to joke in Amber Valley, it's B-Y-O-S. Um, but if it's a, we need to be able to get that critical mass going, but we need to be intentional about it. You need to be able to embrace that idea of churn and look at the kinds of support that isn't just going, isn't going to trade shows in other states trying to lure people over. It's about creating an ecosystem where you reward taking things that come out of these sales and driving it right back into the ecosystem over and over, and then having the pieces parts in between, whether it's the infrastructure uh, or the, the resources at the right time, including higher education, to be able to create a stable, innovative environment for them to be able to succeed. I want to talk about two sort of interesting case studies. Center for Cartoon Studies. Um, how many people have heard of Center for Cartoon Studies? All right, so a good number. So this is a, a school that uh, is a two-year MFA program. Uh, it is now considered the, the leading graphic novel uh, institution in the country. It has got huge name recognition in that the art world, um, and it's based in Wentworth Junction, Vermont. And they now have, at any given time, uh, between 40 and 50 students uh, that are taking classes that are the best of the best, and then the students don't leave. In fact, sometimes we would like them to, but because uh, they keep crowding into the classrooms and taking over the things that the other students need, so they had to create other space for them. So, the, so White River Junction has become this hub of activity in this very specific sector, and the publishing industry has to come now to White River Junction to see where the emerging talent is. <coughs> and they're creating their own work, and they're doing it over time, and the spin-off is fantastic. And again, it's a classic notion of exporting intellectual property and importing cash, whether it's the school itself or the students who are now <coughs> producing award-winning graphic novels, which, by the way, is the only growing part of the publishing industry. Uh, and so I just, I, I throw this out here, Again, we would never have predicted that White River Junction was going to be the graphic novel capital of America if we were like saying, we've got a plan and we're going to make it that and that's how we're going to have an economic engine in White River Junction. But we created the, the, uh, the environment to allow them to be able to arrive there. We gave them inexpensive, actually free uh, space to start up in and to get rolling and then continue to support that over a period of time, including now with traditional economic development investment to be able to expand their incubator. And it's ink incubator. <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay. Um, the other thing I want to comment on is, is dealer.com. Because unlike when the you know, Logic Associates sale went through, uh, there was not necessarily a hue and cry when dealer sold. I heard from some people, oh my god, what's going to happen to the Burlington economy? But there was an equal number of people who said, what a validation. And that's what I think we should all be thinking about. The fact that dealer.com sold for a billion dollars is not only a valuation of dealer.com, it's a valuation of tech in Vermont. And it made news around the country, and I think we were just talking about this, 
we can make that story even bigger. And again, if we had tried to predict we were going to make a 10-year economic development plan and we were going to be the leader in automobile dealer platforms in the country, that would never have come up on our list. And in fact, most of my friends at Google were all surprised that it was based in Vermont. They assumed it was based in Detroit or around Detroit because that's where the dealer.com should be. But no, it was a group of Vermont guys who just started noodling on something and by the way, it kind of worked out. <laughs> and then the question is, how do we make sure that the incredible entrepreneurial spirit and the resources from this get plowed back in so that we have 20, 30, 40 potential dealer.coms then coming up? Because if, the, if that pipeline is not there, this will be a one-time hit. There will be a nice surplus in the state budget for one year, which they will spend. Um, and then there won't be that next step uh, along the way. So a couple of thoughts just to, to leave with. Um, so Larry Page, CEO of Google, is passionate about this. Do not have a plan. <laughs> and we are committed as a company to not have a plan. We measure everything. So we, we look at what is working and what is not. We kill things that don't work very quickly. We put resources behind things that do. But his belief is that if you have a plan, then you think you know more than the market. And he said also then marketing people become in charge and that's the death knell of any tech company. But as a recovering marketer, I, I try not to take offense to that, but, but it's, it's, a, it's real today. And again, that gets back to the, the situation with the Center for Cartoon Studies or dealer.com. That was not in the plan. And yet they were huge successes. Remove constraints. This is the other thing that we do at Google. We look for constraints and innovation and being able to uh, do new things and go out there, whether it's the amount of computing power you have, the amount of storage power, the amount of connectivity, and we just systematically go after them and remove them. That's the same that can be done in Vermont, is to think about what are the constraints people think about and get rid of them one after another after another. Usually it's in your infrastructure. And then the final piece is to be comfortable with churn. That's not the usual pl place for economic development folks, right, to know that there's going to be chaos and you're not sure what's going to work. And we're going to try these 30 things. Laura seems more comfortable with it than most people. But there is a, there is, you've got to be able to be comfortable with that chaos and to have that peripheral vision and to be iterative so that you can allow for these things to happen rather than excluding things that actually are going to be that next economic engine. So with that, I'm going to uh, segue to uh, my friend Matt Boosie, who I would say is the king of churn and not having a plan, uh, and yet has done real estate. So I'm not sure how those things go together, uh, but I will turn it up. Well, I'll turn it over to you. Turn it over to Matt. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So we will have an opportunity for questions after the second presentation, so please don't forget your questions. So now we have uh, Matt, either Matt number one or Matt number two. I don't want to make anybody number two. <laughs> Another Matt, Matt Busey. Matt is a Wyoming native and a Yale trained architect. Film photographer and property developer is known for his transformation of White River Junction, Vermont into the next generation nexus. He is praised for his purchase of early 1,945,000 square foot tip-top bread factory in the heart of the downtown. Busey transformed the dilapidated building, turning raw industrial space into workspaces for artists, creative businesses, a cafe, and health practitioners. Busey is also the owner of Hartford Woolen Mill, his first purchase, and that included maxing out six credit cards, and <laughs> self-construction. Good work, Matt. <laughs> a former American Legion building and the Dreamland building. He has completed three major renovation projects and is starting a fourth in the Upper Valley Village and former railroad community within the last 20 years. Busey's development as a common thread of turning underutilized buildings into creative economy hubs. Matt, welcome. <laughs> So it's true, I, I don't really operate with a plan. And um, so I was gonna show uh, some pictures about 
planless operation. And um, I recently took a test online, and told me I should have been a philosopher. And I looked through a ton of pictures yesterday thinking about that and White River Junction and uh, pulled together a slideshow to kind of think about the philosophy of the creative economic development. Um, it's coming up. Okay. I arrived in White River Junction. Pretty much, if something happens by accident, I believe it. If it's something that I think should be happening, I don't tend to believe it. Um, and the bigger the notion of what I think is going to happen um, is, the less I'm trusting of it. So I really look for feedback from uh, the environment as my primary motivation. And every project I've started in White River Junction has started by accident. The first one was just driving by a building going, man, what's that? calling the number on it and ending up buying it like a year later. Um, the second time was walking and looking for a space to do some film work in, and they sold me the building. Um, <laughs> the third one was being at a cocktail party saying, that building is so ugly, I can't stand it. Oh, it's for sale. I was like, really? Uh, <laughs> and the fourth one was they called, called me and said, you should buy this building. And I was like, no. Um, and then a month later they said, called me again, you should buy this building. And uh, I said, no. And they said, really, you should buy this building. I'm like, well, all right, how much? And they're like, whatever, name a price. And so I gave them the most lowball thought offer. I thought, uh, you know, I, I thought I was sending them a no in financial terms. And they said, OK. So <laughs> I ended up with four buildings. Uh, I did not plan to become a developer. And um, I reluctantly entered into doing it because I had aspirations of being an architect. And I was trained as an architect, um, so that's helped a lot. But um, this, uh, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> uh, I saw this picture and I thought, well, this kind of summarizes my thought process. This is a, this is a um, electron microscope for a photograph of a chalk, piece of chalk, a chalk particle. And um, it reminded me of how like, when you're looking at stuff, it's never what you think it is. So, you know, I thought it was some industrial object or an organic thing, but it's actually a mineral. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's not living, it's not man-made, um, and it has all these great properties. At the same time, you're not really looking at a piece of chalk. You're looking at a projection of a piece of chalk, which is actually blown up even way more than it was in the electron microscope because it's huge on the screen. I mean, you think about the scale represented here; it's enormous. So, I think that. What it represented to me was how, whenever you're doing any kind of development, you really need to traverse all these scales that are, that are present and try to suss out what, um, where the potentials are and whether there is any at all or not. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, is it space bar? Oh, so here's another example. Um, it's a picture of a house. It's not really a house. It's a drawing of a house. And it's a very simple drawing of a house. And then when you go around the corner, it's not even three-dimensional. <laughs> so <clears throat> I love stuff like this because it always reminds me how fallible my mind is and we're easily tricked into seeing patterns and uh, potential where there really isn't any. So I'm totally in favor of the Adam Smasher te technique of finding stuff and you just beat on things over and over again, iterate, 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 like Matt said, until you actually get some real information back. And that's where I think, for me, planning fails because when I plan, I usually come up with one idea, I never question it, and I push it all the way through to the end until I end up with this thing. And usually, I never execute it. <clears throat> so, like I'm not executing the slideshow like I thought I was going to. <laughs> so a little bit about me. This <laughs> is where I grew up. It's Denver, Colorado. The trees have grown a lot since I grew up there. That's a Google map picture, I love that. Um, I went to Middlebury College. I went to the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York City, which was an awesome school that closed the year after I finished. Uh, <laughs> taught me a lot about being in the place that you're going to be working in and pounding the pavement. It was a great school because unlike where I went to school afterwards, Yale University, uh, every day we came into class and they took us out on the street and we just I followed the professor around on the street. We were exhausted at the end of every day and he bought us hot dogs from hot dog stands. But um, you know, it really was a great experience of looking at what you're talking about rather than thinking about what you're talking about and looking at representations of what you're talking about. We were actually looking at the stuff. So I went to Yale University, and then I ended up in White River Junction. 
Um, I worked for New England Digital. Uh, we made synth synthesizers. In my first job, I wrote software. I developed, uh, I developed the software that allows you to move a mouse over sound and hear it go whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, <laughs> if they had patented it out, they would have survived, but they didn't. Uh, they got eaten up by the technology. I made maple syrup. Uh, I cleaned up after Irene. I ran for the select board in a costume and lost. And then uh, two years later, I ran with absolutely no campaign and won by a landslide. So again, that taught me a lot about planning and intention. <laughs> I like to get dressed up and get crazy at parties. And uh, I also like economy. <laughs> and I can look like, you know, a business person. Uh, I make movies, uh, I'm a cinematographer, and uh, I shoot a series called uh, Star Trek Continues. This is us shooting on location in California. It's an online, uh, online show. It's got a pretty huge audience. We've, we've clipped over a million views for our first two episodes already, and we just released last year. Um, this is what it looks like. It's the original Star Trek done with new scripts. They rebuilt the entire set uh, from plans that I redrew as an architect from the original Paramount set. Uh, these guys are fanatical about Star Trek. I mean, I liked it as a kid, but these guys, over the top, I mean, they really think they are the characters. Uh, I've shot a lot of movies, shorts. These are just some stills from, of the work I do. Um, I love working with light. Um, this was a short film I did last year that's one probably 25 awards around the country. Um, making films is a total like crapshoot. You just never know what's gonna happen. We made this film, I've made a lot of films, probably 50 at this point. This one we made, you never know how it's gonna go. We sent it out to the festival circuit. I got a call from the director. He's like, are you driving or anything? I'm like, yes. He goes, well, pull over. I'm like, I'm not gonna pull over. Just tell me. He goes, we won the Seattle International Film Festival, best film award, the short. And it's a huge festival. We won out of 3,000 entries, um, best film. From then on, it just sort of took off, so it's fun. I'm working on a web series in White River Junction called Ultra Reds about Andy Warhol's granddaughter, and um, it's a time travel kind of thing. I love working on electronics. I do things like this uh, with Gabriel, my partner. Uh, I do electronics with the shoes here. I'm a pilot. I love flying around. I started a flight school in Ever Valley, because the one that I was taking lessons from went out of business, so it's the only way to get a, only way to get a license. Uh, <laughs> my favorite band is The Talking Heads. My favorite movie is The Razor Head. My favorite book is QED by Richard Feynman, and that's my favorite kind of plane. Uh, White River Junction. So I ended up there because... <laughs> I ended up there because uh, of New England Digital, really. I had no idea where White River Junction was. I went to Middlebury College. New England Digital hired me. I came there to write software. And I arrived and immediately thought, wow, this is the strangest place I've ever been. I, I got to live here. Um, <laughs> it just had an odd feel about it because there was the sense of industry and the, and the feeling of the resonance of all the industry that was there, but it was kind of all gone. And the downtown still had a little bit of a um, you know, a little bit of an economy going. The, the department store was still there. The you know office supply store was there. There was a bank, but they were closing. You know, month after month, that one would close. So um, it kind of got left with what made it start in the first place, which was interstate. There's two interstates across there. There's the rivers, and then there's the railroads, and those were like the three elements of commerce that were intersecting on White River Junction. And it occurred to me, even though everything was closing at the time, I was like, this is an amazing place. I mean, it has huge potential. It's got all the infrastructure to make it go, and it's just falling apart. And the reason largely was at the time, from my perception, that everyone there was really down about it. It had been going downhill for so long that everyone had this baked in, this place is terrible, um, you know, attitude. We have the Quichy Gorge, though. <laughs> uh, so White River, when I uh, moved here, uh, was kind of sleepy. This is the view coming into town. Um, it has a kind of cool geographical layout. Um, it's you know in a valley, squeezed between a river and a railroad and a hill, and uh, really conforms to the geography there. It has a small downtown, which is you know quasi quasi urban for about 600 feet. Um, the buildings there, there's some really great buildings. Um, the guy who designed uh, this building, right here, actually went to architecture school in France, um, designed the tip-top building too. Really nice, really nice building. But uh, you know, it's classic Vermont town, older, older building stock, 
We have public transit. We have a lot of opportunities too. Um, buildings burn down periodically, leaving holes, and these things are getting infilled now. <clears throat> and uh, all this, all those spaces, lots of great weird spaces in town. I love the sort of feel of the place, and that's what attracted me to it. Um, beautiful church, funny intersections, funny signs, <laughs> odd staircases, <clears throat> lots of uh, state-imposed <laughs> signage, and uh, you know compositions like this all over the place which really speak to no planning. <laughs> and then, you know, things like this, old railroad underpasses that just got rebuilt. So when I started when I started doing my real estate development, this was sort of my relationship to money. Um, I was like totally in my cat world. And I knew there was money around, but I couldn't quite figure out how it related to me. And, you know, this cat didn't even realize the money was fake, so um, <laughs> it's more interested in the carpet. So I was kind of like quasi focused on on what I was doing, which was software and you know interest in architecture. So I bought this thing, and um, I still live there, and it still looks actually it looks worse than this now. Uh, it had a sign on it, it said for sale, and um, I called up the number on it. And the guy said it was three hundred thousand dollars. I was like, what? Three hundred thousand dollars? This was in the nineties. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, and he said, well, it's brand new. Like, what's the problem? I said, are you kidding me? You're telling me that thing's brand new? And I said, it's paint's falling off. It looks hell. Like, I goes, oh, that building. He goes, you can have that one for almost nothing. So um, <laughs> I went and toured it, and it was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Big, and, big open spaces inside. It was kind of like my dream come true. I have these dreams all the time of giant spaces that I'm discovering. And um, you know, I was walking in there, it was like being in my dream. So I was like, okay, I gotta buy this thing. And um, I didn't know how to buy a building. So I was like, well, I guess I have to go to a bank. So I went to like six banks and um, it was really hilarious. They must've thought I was an idiot. Uh, I was like 29, I'm touring them through this building, which is basically falling down. And uh, I'm telling them how great it's gonna be. And you know, they, got, they were very excited about my enthusiasm, and we had a lot of fun talking about it, but the answer was always no. And it took like two months to get no's, which I found really frustrating. Uh, I think they just didn't want to discourage me, but they're hoping some other bank would pick me up. Uh, but finally got all no's, and I went back to the owner, and I said, look, I, I have no money, and um, the bank won't owe me any money. He goes, well, okay, you can have it for nothing. <laughs> Take it off my hands, please. <laughs> he was like 75 years old. He would he was like probably White River Junction's original creative economy person. He was he he used to own this mill. He was uh fam long, you know, sort of Hartford old money, owned the mill, his father owned the mill, grandfather owned the mill, great grandfather owned the mill. And he was up there on the third floor in this tiny room with an open five-gallon pail of lacquer taking the old bobbins and turning them into candlesticks. I think I think he was high as a kite. He came there every day and just got stoned on the locker and was stumbling down the stairs at about four in the afternoon. Uh, that, was his, that was his thing and he had a actually pretty big business from it and you still see these things all over the place. Um, he had become the federal foreclosure agent for all the mills in the area. So he had access to all these bobbins. I mean, literally, that entire building was full of bobbins when I bought it and I had to, he said the deal is, you have to wait till I get rid of all these bobbins. So he slowly got rid of the bobbins and I slowly started renovating the space myself. And uh, being 29, I was like, yeah, I can have a full-time job and I can do this project. So I would work from nine until six or seven at night, come here and work until one or two in the morning doing construction, <laughs> go back and work. And I did that for seven years. Um, however, I didn't have any money, so. Um, <laughs> This was kind of the situation at the end of, in, in the middle of my process, I was like, oh my God. And uh, you know, I came up with different paint schemes for the thing. <laughs> anyway, my, my credit card's maxed out and I figured out you really can't transfer balances forever. And uh, my dad's a businessman, so one day he's like, how's it going? And I said, well, I don't know what to do exactly. I've got all these credit cards and they're sort of bouncing around and building up. And he just got, he got so angry with me. He's like, I can't believe, you know, one of those dad moments. Um, so he's like, okay, how much money do you owe? And it was like $38,000 to the credit card companies, which wasn't that much money really, but to me, 
it was like the end of the world. There was no way I could see how to recover that. So he, he bought half the property from me with the uh, agreement that I had to buy it back from him in five years for 9% profit. <laughs> he goes, this will teach you about time money relationship. <laughs> so I sat down with a spreadsheet for like, I was like, my best moments have really been when I've hit rock bottom. Like when I feel like I can't make any moves, I'm just completely wiped out. So I literally sat down in this like super depressed state with a spreadsheet and started like going through all the functions. NPV, hmm, okay. Future value, um, internal rate of return. I was like, what the hell is all this stuff? So actually, in two weeks, I pretty had, had a pretty good handle on it. And I was like, oh my god, I can save myself. So um, I did this 20 year projection on the building, very proudly mailed it to my dad, and he was like, okay, good. Um, and you know, within a couple of years, I'd actually paid it back. And um, <clears throat> I had tenants you know, in the building moving in. Uh, I learned about the state regulatory process. The inspector showed up one day and said, where are your permits? I'm like, what permits? I thought it was Vermont. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 you have to have a permit. I'm like, okay, where do I get a permit? He goes, you have to go to Springfield. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll go there tomorrow. So I drove down to Springfield, walked in, and I said, I'm here to get a permit. And they're like, for what? I said, I'm renovating a building. They said, well, where are your I said, I didn't have to drawings. I asked him to do a piece of paper. So he goes, yeah. And he gave me a piece of copy paper. I drew the building out and said, here. And he's like, OK. Uh, I was like, yep, it is Vermont. Sadly, it's not that way anymore, I'm afraid. It's gotten, in the last 20 years, things have gotten much more um, like regulated. So that building turned out to be you know, OK. And I, uh, I survived. And, learned a lot. It was actually, I'm so fortunate to have crashed and burned on my first building with a relatively low amount of capital because it taught me everything I needed to do to do these next projects. So I walked into this building and they, you know, I wanted to rent like a little closet basically and they sold me the whole building. Um, the situation was White River was still sort of nose diving and um, they had a $250,000 note on this building, 45,000 square feet. They wanted to get rid of it. So I was like, OK. Um, and all that they wanted me to do was pay off their note. I was like, damn, that's cheap real estate. So I got my spreadsheets out. I sort of did my uh, calculations as I did them before for the other building and had confidence because I'd seen that work. And I was like, this, like, this is a no-brainer. Even if the town goes to total hell, this is a no-brainer. Um, so bought that building, um, borrowed some money. And uh, this time, the banks were OK talking to me. Um, the uh, project had no plan whatsoever. I was like, buy it, see what happens. Um, it already had five tenants, and it was cash flowing positive. So I was like, even if nothing happens, I'm not losing money. Uh, so then we started renovating it. And um, let me just show you a little bit about it. Here's, uh, here's what it looked like in 1910. Uh, it was a single little building on the block, and they slowly expanded it, putting additions on mainly for transportation purposes, trucks and stuff, because it was a bakery and they had a lot of deliveries. Um, out back on the tracks, which I recently got like told I can't stand there anymore by the police. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe how many pictures I have on the tracks. Um, you know, the, the building was basically uh, <clears throat> run down, roof was shot, windows were shot, everything was shot. And um, the Valley News, our local paper, decided to do a front page story about it. And I've discovered the secret to all economic development is to get your face on the front page on the top half. It, it works miracles. And the best way to do it is not to tell them anything. Let them find it, and then they'll be all excited about it, put you on the top of the page. If you go PRing them, press releasing, they don't pay any attention to you. So I never tell the newspaper anything. Um, I might like send messages around through like seven indirect channels, but um, it really works. And they, they all have it. This is my office. It doesn't look like that now. <laughs> Piles of paper. Uh, this is the drawing I did, so to just show you the level of planning that I did. That is the drawing for that whole building. There's another one for a second floor, but that was it. Um, so I went through the entire process. That was my complete planning process, was this little sketch. Um, and it served pretty well, actually. Uh, always get your you know, hands dirty. Uh, excavators were too expensive. I called up the rental place, said, bring me a, front, bring me a backhoe. And uh, they did, and I learned how to drive it. Uh, saved myself a lot of money. Uh, we, uh, we renovated the perimeter spaces of the building first to try to show to the town that something's actually happening. Because I found the best form of advertising is construction. If people actually see something happening, they pay attention. If they hear people talking about something happening, 
we'll wait and see. So the building was basically hollow. We renovated the exterior spaces to give an impression. We threw uh, an open house in December 2001. I expected no one to show up because 9-11 had just happened. There was like economic development was sort of very, everything quieted down. But we had like, we had like 700 people come to this thing and I ended up renting the building out in, in about three weeks. Um, so we uh, feverishly renovated the building. This is what it looks like today. Um, there's a cafe, tip, uh, pottery place, and you paint your own pottery. There's a lot of artist studios on the second floor. Um, the hallways I've made um, fairly large, and they basically operate as art galleries. Um, painters, our, our uh, first Fridays, we have, have open house first Friday, you're, you're well attended. Um, it's a printmaking studio, karate space, yoga space, um, more art studios. There's Gabriel. <laughs> Sculptors, and um, I, I, the cheapest way to make something look fresh is to paint in bright colors. And I sort of went hog wild in here, and uh, I think it really worked. There's so many textures in the building, and we went with silver as well, sort of call out the textures and honor the past of the building, and not spend a ton of money. And the goal was basically to offer the spaces at well below market rate, and to this day they're still well below market rate. Um, these are just some of the some of the looks on the inside of the building, we opened up the interior to let light come down through the middle of it since it's gigantic. Um, we have uh, First Fridays, like I mentioned, uh, lots of events going on there, gallery talks, performances, and uh, to give you an idea of that distance we had to travel to get there, this is what the building looked like when, uh, when I bought it. That was the interior. Um, it was a rainforest, basically. The roof was shot, water was pouring down, rusting everything. Electrical boxes would spark and explode all the time. Uh, the roof was gone. That's the entrance, which I just showed you a few slides before. Um, well, more than I thought. That's that space. <laughs> That's what it looked like when I bought it. <laughs> I mean, literally falling apart. Um, but I was very excited by this, and, and uh, we ended up spending only $35 a square foot renovating it. I was a general contractor. I was hiring people off the street. They were getting hauled off by the police for breaking their paroles. You know, it was, it was a good time. Lots of fake social security numbers that I never got resolved. Uh, and this is a great, I love this picture because it's like, this is what planning does to you. You think you've got the thing in the right place, and then, oh my god, no, that's a bad idea. Let's put it over here. Uh, that's where the door was going to go, and that's how tall it was going to be, and then that's where it ended up going. Um, this building, I literally drew the building on the building. So all the walls and stuff were laid out by me, like going on with chalk and spray paint, and just saying to the contractors, here's where the wall goes. And I brought the fire marshal up and said, here's the plan. <laughs> he's like, OK, full scale drawings. Um, <laughs> Where do I stamp them? I don't know. Um, these are some comparison photos of the, of the building. So before and after in the same locations. Um, there's, there's that comparison I was trying to draw. These are a little small, sorry. Um, the iterative process and the non-planning process means that you build something and try something, build something, try something. So as far as like the interior design went, um, I would have the painters and the car carpenters build everything the way I wanted it and paint it white. And then uh, I would go into Photoshop and uh, color it. And then I'd hold up the paint chips to my screen, find the colors. Um, and then I'd num number them and hand them to the painting contractors to go off and paint them. So that's, that's what happens. And it's a really fun way of playing with buildings and just using computer tools to simulate what things are going to look like. More of those. Um, the social aspect of the building turned out to be a really huge aspect of it. So we started throwing lots of parties. Um, and this was really like a community thing. So um, there's a clothing store in town, Revolution. Kim Souza runs it. She organizes a lot of parties. Um, this is the Halloween party that we um, throw annually. Um, <clears throat> we kind of took a lesson from New Orleans and Mardi Gras and decided to turn our Halloween party into a costume parade. First year we did it, there were like 50 of us, we just went around, went around the block. The second year, people heard about it and more like 200 people showed up. And um, 
We couldn't walk on the sidewalk. So we just paraded down the street. Somebody called the police and said there was a riot or something. Uh, the squad car pulls up. We have a brass band. Uh, and uh, he's like, what's going on? I'm like, it's a parade. And he's like, what? And uh, he got back in his car and left. I was like, OK. Uh, <laughs> 10 minutes later, chief of police arrives. He'd be gotten out of bed. He's like, what is going on? He's like, it's our Halloween parade. He goes, well, you didn't get a permit. I said, well, we didn't know this many people were going to show up. It just sort of happened. And he goes, OK, well, you need an escort. I'm like, OK, great, escort. And he's like, he gets out in front of the parade, puts his lights on. <laughs> Became a tradition. Next year, he brought his kids. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have White River Indie Films, which is a, a local group I helped co-found. Uh, it's an independent film festival. It runs usually three days in April. Um, that started. That ran in the Tip Top too. So all these pro all these social things were happening in the Tip Top. Um, they now spread out and like moved all around town, which is great. Um, so the fashion show the Revolution puts on, um, the dance party afterwards. That's in the cafe downstairs. Um, we had, a, we had a party, and we turned the elevator into a bar, which we found out was illegal later, uh, <laughs> to celebrate an artist uh, hanging out of these giant wooden spoons, Rhea Bloss. There she is with her spoon hat. Um, and you know, we just kind of do these things all the time. They're not necessarily announced. Uh, there was a ballet recital going on at the same time. We didn't realize it, so the parents were pushing the elevator button, going up to see their child do a ballet performance and there's a bar and a party going on with your opens. And they were just like, wow! And like, we had them a glass of wine and some blonde to their recital. Uh, so they really enjoyed it. Um, this is the an elevation drawing I did of the, uh, the tip top. Well, actually, uh, two uh, friends, Danny, Danny Sagan and Lisa Dworsky, helped me on this project. Um, they're here in Montpelier. And uh, I went to school with them. So. Uh, I called it uh, architectural therapy with them. They weren't really <laughs> the official architects, but we would get together and we would sort of do design therapy. And it was really great having them. I love bouncing ideas off people. This is the ugly building that I ended up buying after a cocktail party. And um, <laughs> it's right across from the street from the tip top. And I don't know, I, I probably shouldn't hate on buildings, but I really hated this building. Um, it just irritated me. So. Um, I ended up buying it thinking we were going to do something and um, I worked with a partner on this and we hired an architect and uh, this is what it used to look like. It was actually a really kind of beautiful theater which got torn down in the 60s because the movie business was sinking and they built this thing. Uh, I was like, wow. Uh, I went to the town offices and I found that is exactly the way it's drawn in the permit. <laughs> I was like, wow, OK. So anyway, I was like, I sort of went to the other extreme and like, I have to erase this building. So we started doing these crazy designs for it and uh, trying all sorts of different coloring patterns and shapes and things. We uh, sort of settled on this thing. Uh, and uh, that's what it was going to look like. Probably not that bright in reality. But it ended up coming in at way too much money. So I scaled the whole project back and uh, ended up just resurfacing the front of the building. This is the elevations. And uh, that's sort of the model. Ends up being much more neutral, and this is the transformation of it into, uh, into the new facade. And uh, really, I was just trying to get rid of the um, ugly faux Mount Vernon colonial, whatever was going on there. And uh, it was interesting doing this project, because unlike the tip top, which didn't have a lot of exterior <laughs> transformation, this one was a radical transformation. And I, uh, people at first really didn't, a lot of people didn't like it. Um, but Pretty much all those people have come back to me and said that it's warm. They've warmed up to it, and it was a difficult facade. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just and we just busted through the roof a little bit to move graphically and made some patterns that were similar to the bridge nearby and opened up the bottom to storefront uh, glazing to sort of make the building have some presence on the street. Um, <clears throat> I have turned down some projects like this building fell in my lap. I went and looked at it. I loved it, but it just didn't make sense. It was a paper mill. And then this is the Legion building, which is the current project I'm working on in South Main Street. One of the things I really thought White River needs more of is downtown residents. You know, kind of at night it's very dead. And uh, less so with a cartoon skull, which has really made a huge impact, like Matt said. I mean, it's been amazing. And uh, Northern Stage, which is an equity theater company in town, it's just about to start construction on a new theater there, also brings a lot of uh, regional actors, mostly from New York City, into the town. So we have. We have a, you know, sort of a great spread of um, ages through White River Junction now. When I was there, there was like no one in their 20s. Now it's pretty much, you know, uh, all ages, which is great. Um, this project sort of fell into my lap, and 
when I when it did, I'm like, what am I going to do with this thing? That's one giant space upstairs there, a giant giant function hall. And as much as I love giant spaces, I thought, you know, what what I've been saying, what I need to sort of follow up on is the uh, the need for residents. So we're going to turn this into a 22-unit uh, apartment building on the second floor, and then it'll be commercial space on the first floor. And we really wanted to do a great energy retrofit on this building because um, last winter I just got killed by the cold winter and the high fuel prices, and I'm like, I need to hedge against that. So we're going to do a super thermal envelope on this building. It'll <clears throat> pretty much use it leaves a really small amount of energy despite all the glass in it. Um, and uh, we wanted it to be playful and contrib contribute to uh, sort of a new aesthetic on South Main Street. South Main Street is, I don't think I have any pictures here of it, but it's, it's kind of run down, it still is run down. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> uh, the hope is that this building, and I think buildings really do message, they communicate a lot to people. Uh, I've learned that with my work on the other buildings, that you know the first couple seconds of an impression that uh, a building makes on people informs them about the intention of the people that live here, the safety, quality of life, of the community, and um, help them to start thinking about potential in this area. After I did the tip top, it, a huge amount of development happened. Nobody did anything in my group for quite a while, so, and I was just very brazenly saying, this is the best town in the world, this is, uh, this, I, I told the Boston Globe when they came up to do an interview, I said, this is gonna be the next art mecca of New England. Um, and they printed it, which was, I was like kind of embarrassed, but uh, we, had, we had people from Massachusetts driving up for weeks, uh, kind of going. <laughs> I was like, oops. Uh, not yet. Uh, but then CCS showed up, and like Northern Stage has developed, and uh, other creative people have moved into town. So I really think that, you know, thinking that consistently over the last 20 years has helped make it happen because every time someone asks me about it, I'm like, oh yeah, Art Mecca. Um, and that comes through. So one of my tradition, one of the traditions is that every time I get a building, we have to throw a big party in it. So this is the party in the Legion building. It was New Year's, and we were like, "What are we going to do for New Year's?" Um, and I don't know, remember how it happened, but I was like, "Somebody was talking about having the dropping ball." I'm like, "Well, that's just like everyone does the dropping ball." I said, "Let's figure out something else. Let's have the sunset." And I was like, "Where is the sunset at midnight?" Where's the sun setting at midnight in White River Junction? I said, oh, it's in the Pacific. Oh, it's right where that giant trash swirl is that they can't control and there's growing new organisms. I said, well, okay, we're gonna have a giant sunset over the trash swirl in the Pacific. <laughs> so that's what we did. We like, got all this trash and brought it together and um, <clears throat> people danced around in the trash and there was a big scrim back there that the sun came down. So I, I think that like <laughs> doing this kind of thing really helps people get in their minds that something new is happening. Um, it, it's great to sort of mix it up um, you know, become, go for the media. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm getting to be man. <clears throat> One of the things I've noticed is that in my thought process, which I think is basically my creative thought process, is always try to find unlikes to combine with each other and see what happens. So that's sort of the atom smashing planless approach where you hybridize unlike systems. So you take things that don't belong together and put them together and see what happens. And even if you don't end up using whatever that thing is, it gives you a lot of really great information that you can use moving forward in more practical situations. So, uh, why you do that, I don't know, but I love it. <laughs> it's like, I think it's supposed to be a like, nice painting, but it's so violent. Um, I'm not really sure. But it basically, I don't know what to make of it, which I like. Um, things like this I love. You're just taking, you're, you're doing something to a building that's incongruous to the building. Um, <clears throat> you know, different modes of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Unusual positions. Uh, incongruities. And uh, strange labels. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>
Yes, yeah, in the back. Yeah, this, uh, I spent two years in Raymond Junction. I worked at the Hotel Coolidge. What's happening with the Hotel Coolidge? Um, it's still there. <laughs> uh, there are some pictures of it in there. Uh, David Briggs, uh, the proprietor, is still still running it. It's uh, it's a hotel. A lot of people live there. Um, a lot of the cartoon school students live there. Uh, there's a hostel and up on the top floor. And you know, it's actually uh, it still remains a uh, relatively busy place. And it's the only hotel in town. So if you're going to stay in White River, that's where you stay. Um, it has a lot of regulars. People come back in the summertime to uh, to stay there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a comment and a question for Matt Lucy. Um, Matt, you said I believe in your presentation that your favorite school you went to went under after you left, and then the, the pilot training program went out after you. Did you help a lot of people within the district uh, five actually to be coordinated? My question for you is: Would you consider uh, investing in another community? <laughs> well, that, that one project that I didn't go for was in Bellas Falls, um, and one of the major problems for me was the time I was going to be spending going back and forth. You have to babysit these projects. I mean, you've got to be there every day in their development, um, or you've got to have somebody you really trust, and so far I haven't found anyone like that. Um, I'm hearing your open uh, <laughs> As long as I don't know what's going to happen, and you catch me, you know, at a cocktail party, probably no okay. <laughs> no planning. No, I've actually I've, I've talked to a lot of different um, groups in different towns about developing their buildings, and I mean, I, I've just given them the lowdown on the economic reality of it. And the, and the fact is, if you don't do it yourself and you hire a lot of people to help you, it's going to cost you a lot of money, and it probably won't work. Um, you got to have people who are willing to put in the time and the energy and the physical labor. Problem is now, you have to have, well it's in Hartford, everything's gotta be stamped, everything's gotta be a licensed you know, person. Um, the, everyone's gotta be a licensed contractor. You know, it's, it's gone from being <clears throat> fairly open framework to totally like regimented, regulated. And the problem with that is, uh, it, it just drives the cost up dramatically, and I'm not sure it's I'm not sure you get a heck of a lot of benefit out of it, um, other than the um, you know the people running the departments have more peace of mind that if something happens they're not going to be held liable for it, and so it's it's a liability. It, it, it feels like liability is driving everything, and it's it's really it's too bad because it, it scares away anyone who's willing to take a risk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. So thank you all again very much for coming. On your tables, there are these uh, cute little green cards. Um, if you would please fill them out and leave them at the table as you leave. And we also have the opportunity for anyone interested uh, to take a tour of uh, Norwich, a student-led tour. And if you would meet Jen at the, uh, at the back table, she will make sure uh, that happens. So again, thank you to both our speakers. A very interesting uh, and dynamic presentation and uh, certainly a different perspective on economic development. So again, thank you very much. Have a great day.